Respiratory failure occurs when the respiratory system no longer functions. Patients with RF will need supplementary oxygen therapy or they will rely on mechanical ventilation. Respiratory failure can be the result of COPD, cystic fibrosis, or an acute injury directly to the lungs or even to other parts of the body that triggers the systemic response. Acute lung injury and ARDS, acute respiratory distress syndrome, these are the most common seen as part of the systemic inflammation response that we will also see when we discuss sepsis, burn, and major trauma. Therefore, in this case, the condition can be part of a multiple organ distress syndrome or multiple organ failure. The type of injury that can lead to a respiratory distress syndrome include injuries that are affecting the respiratory system, obviously. So for example, we can have severe pneumonia, uh, pulmonary contusion, or pulmonary edema, or even fat embolism. So basically here, uh, fat content gets into the blood circulation and eventually it gets stuck in the lungs. And then also, of course, if we have a near drowning incident. So all of these injuries are directly affecting the respiratory system. They're a direct injury to the lungs. Whereas we also have indirect injuries that are more systemic in terms of its impact by inflammation. So we already mentioned sepsis, severe sepsis, trauma, and acute pancreatitis. And this one we mentioned when um, we discussed accessory diseases in the GI system. And of course, massive transfusion because there's a lot of foreign cells and fluids coming in for this procedure. And also we may see it with drug overdose. ARDS is an acute onset. It can start within 48 to 72 hours after the initial injury. In the development of this condition, the body responds to cytokines and free radicals. Usually, these are pro-inflammatory. As a result, many people develop pulmonary edema, which increases the thickness of the villi and the capillary space. This will make the gas exchange more challenging because literally the oxygen molecule in this situation must diffuse over a longer distance to reach the blood. So that makes it more difficult for our body to acquire the needed oxygen. This impaired gas exchange leads to a condition called hypoxia, low oxygen status. And so this increases the work for breathing. As a compensation strategy, the patient in ARDS will have a very hard, laborious breath. But the compensation in most cases is not adequate on their own. So they're not able to make up and get enough oxygen in this case. So this left if untreated becomes life threatening. Major symptoms include breathing difficulty, severe low oxygen in the blood and loss of surfactant. And we remember this is the chemical that keeps the villi inflated. When we have a decreased amount of surfactant, we keep losing more vital air volume because once these air sacs close, they no longer are able to take in air. We can also see protein-rich fluid linked into the interstitia and the alveolar lumen. So this is also going to take up volume that is supposed to be occupied by air. All of this contrib contributes to less volume so less lung capacity available for normal breathing. In many cases, RF or respiratory failure patients, they'll require intubation and mechanical ventilation. And on average, this may last 10 to 14 days, so about two weeks. 
So you can imagine how what the cost to the system would be. What happens in intubation is that we have a endotracheal tube. So it goes in through the mouth and then ends here in the trachea. And this will ensure that if we have ventilation or oxygen therapy here, it goes down the right path. So it's going down the trachea rather than in the GI tract, which may cause a lot of air in the GI system. So this figure shows where the tube is inserted. Uh, the tracheal tube, it is inserted between the vocal cords. Obviously, when someone is intubated, we're going to have to think about nutrition support. Not counting the oral diet because this is not possible. And not to mention a lot of RF patients are not conscious or not alert. They may be in a coma themselves or even in a medically induced coma. So basically oral intake is not a possibility. So usually enteral feeding is preferred unless there are some other contraindications. When we conduct a nutrition assessment, we know with respiratory diseases, especially COPD, um, they are associated with older age. Therefore, in assessing the patient's history, be sure to check their age and also their prior disease history. Often these factors lead to a hypermetabolic status. If the RF is a result of COPD, usually these patients will enter the unit already malnourished. So we mentioned that in COPD, the patients, uh, are often going to have lower BMI, um, and lower BMI is often associated with a higher incidence of COPD. So again, the disease itself over time further exacerbates malnutrition. Ideally, we would use indirect calorimetry to estimate the needs. When that's not available, um, we can use this. So either 25 calories per kilo or 130% of the basal energy expenditure. So we would um, determine what the BEE is and multiply it by 1.3. Because in this case, it is acute organ failure, it is a critical condition. Therefore, the energy needs are high, not to mention the extra muscle work that we're trying in trying to breathe better that the patient's doing. So all of those are associated with increased energy needs. When we monitor for nutrition support, we need to keep in mind that for ventilated patients, we need to avoid oral feeding because, remember, to metabolize the micronutrients, we rely on oxygen that is brought to the body by the lungs. But now we are having respiratory failure. So although we know that they need more energy, it may not be the best choice to give to them. We don't want them to have too much because if we give them more, um, the more that we give them, the more CO2 the body will generate. And this will add on to the burden of the lungs that the lungs already carry and also make it worse. Therefore, we really wanna watch the amount of energy that the patients are getting. And just a reminder here of the maximum glucose infusion rates, we definitely don't want to exceed this in uh, this particular condition. Also, protein needs are on the higher end, um, which is common in other critical conditions or in metabolic stress status. Potential problems in the nutrition diagnosis, we have inadequate enteral nutrition infusion or excessive enteral nutrition infusion. 
So this sends a signal to us that we really need to closely monitor the tolerance of the enteral feedings as well as the progress that the patient is making. We also see here inappropriate intake of fat. And we mention this because some enteral formulas have a higher fat content. And this is because we're trying to reduce the CO2 production. But again, this is not something we would put a patient on for, on a routine basis or for a long period of time. So here we have two sample PES statements, and you can look at these a little closely um, on your own. So we see in this case, a lot of the nutrition diagnosis are actually related to the necessity to adjust nutrition support. The goals of intervention include um, that we want to provide adequate but not excessive energy and protein because this is helpful for metabolic stress in critically ill patients. Also, this will help to preserve and restore lean body mass. And we know that people with respiratory disease are more likely to have malnutrition. We want to maintain fluid balance. And if they are on mechanical ventilation, we have to try the best to facilitate weaning off from the ventilation. For example, we don't want to overfeed a patient on mechanical ventilation. Overfeeding is actually associated with a longer period of time that the patient will have to be on the ventilator. And once the ventilation stops, we want to transition to a high calorie and high protein diet because at this moment, they still probably won't ha be having a lot of food intake. Therefore, we'll want to make the density of the calorie and protein higher. So again, making every bite count. We mentioned there are enteral formulas with higher fat content, so that will help us reduce the amount of carb in the formula, which reduces CO2 production. Also, patients are often under fluid restriction. So we would consider these uh, formulas that have the higher calorie content than some of the standard ones. We also could consider using formulas that have higher amounts of these active fatty acids. For example, EPA, this is uh, one of the components in fish oil, and also we have gamma linolenic acid. All of these are omega-3 or the derivative of omega-3 fatty acids, and they could enhance the body's ability to calm down the inflammation that is going on. And to note, a formula that's made specifically for pulmonary disease is Oxipa by the company Abbott. So in the table that summarizes the main tube feeding formulas for critically ill patients, this formula is on it. And we'll go over that more when we discuss critical, critical illness, so be sure to keep that as a resource. For the higher protein allowance, this is definitely consistent with therapy for uh, critical illness. We do have strong immune enhancing formulas, but right now we do not really have strong evidence. We do have some immune enhancing formulas that exists, but right now we really do not have the evidence to support the use of these formulas on a routine basis, especially not being used in the ICU. Evidence indicates that if we start enteral feeding within the first 24 hours after admission, it is associated with a shorter length of stay and decreased mortality. Therefore, early initiation of tube feeding is indicated. However, we will want to start tube feeding, um, we'll also need to be considering certain factors. In addition to the usual indications and contraindications, we also need to remember how um, that these are critically ill patients. So we need to take into account how stable they are, 
if they have nausea, bloating, or distended abdomen. So these would indicate that there may be something wrong in the GI system. So this is a systemic response to stress, and there may not be direct injury to the GI tract, but as part of the stress response, we may also have stress, for example, in the stomach. So these things may change our decision or strategy for enteral feedings. As always, we want to promote the use of evidence-based practice guidelines. Aspen and the Academy have been working together to create practice guidelines for respiratory failure patients. So here we have a brief summary of the main recommendations. Of course, when needed, we would want to go back to check the whole database for complete evidence. 